visual thinking, um, and it's all about how to turn abstract ideas into simple images. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, basically it's fun, but it is also um, alleged to promote critical thinking. And we're supposed to be doing that here at work, so it seemed like um, another approach to critical thinking. Um, it's also supposed to uh, increase creativity and innovation. These are all claims that are made based on possibly dubious psychological experiments. Anyway, um, what I was hoping to do when I went to this talk at QCon was to learn how to solve problems visually. So the talk was um, called Ideas Not Art, Drawing Out Solutions, and it was given by a woman called Heather Willens, who works at a small outfit called Image Think in New York. Um, it was at QCon London, and uh, at QCon, she did um, various uh, large-scale drawings. Um, in, um, so the first one that she did was in a keynote speech, which was given by Professor Barbara Liskov, a very famous computer scientist. Um, and the, um, this is um, a shot of the large drawing she made. It was on a kind of massive board and she drew most of this during the actual keynote presentation. I think she sort of did some colouring in and tidying up afterwards. Um, but the idea of having her there, and I believe it's quite popular in the posher um, conferences these days, is to have some sort of graphic representation of your keynotes or your important speeches. So, my talk is um, based on the video and the presentation that Heather Williams gave. Um, she, first thing she did really was to ask um, of her audience the question I'm going to ask you now, who, who doodles? The, so, yeah, don't be shy, because I, I do, I do, I love doodling. Um, it's got a bad name in some quarters, and um, it's thought to be a bit stupid, um, might be wasting time, might mean you're not paying attention to what's going on if you're doodling in a meeting or um, a presentation or a talk, but I'd like to encourage you to, if you feel like it, doodle away now. I have no problem with it. Uh, I, I, it's not unacceptable to me, I think it's fine, so do do away. And in fact, when I was telling um, the guys that I went to QCon with afterwards about this talk, um, I was describing it, and Nick said, she gave you permission to doodle. And I thought, that's it, that, that was a great thing, it was a great summary that Nick gave of, of, of the talk, even though he hadn't been there, and uh, I liked having permission to doodle. Um, and... Uh, Funnily enough, I was reading a blog about this talk the other day, and the guy writing the blog, he was one of the organisers, Trifoot guy, um, he, he came up with the same thing. Basically, the talk was about allowing you to doodle. So, <clears throat> that's what my talk is all about today, really. <coughs> so, Heather Willens claimed that doodling is synonymous with visual learning. I don't think I'd go quite that far, but... Um, Visual learning is, is where you learn stuff by one of the modes of learning through um, making pictures, mental pictures or seeing pictures that help you to uh, learn stuff, understand it and memorise it, get it in there. And um, if you want to solve problems visually, you're going to have to be able to do visual learning. So, uh, this slide is um, from some developers at an outfit called Essenticarts. Um, they do digital design and development. 
including UI design and um, content management systems. And I guess they had a bit of fun putting this together. There's a troll down here, a moomin troll um, cat. Um, it's been put together from stuff, but obviously they're, they're quite keen on them. Um, doodling. So, they're um, supposed to be four benefits um, that Heather told us about from um, doodling or creating images, from talks or meetings, um, helping you memorise, helping you to communicate um, to other people what's happened um, in the talk or the meeting, um, enabling you to tell a story about it. That for the um, slide that I showed that Heather had done about the um, keynote speech from Barbara Liskov, you could go back to that um, and, and kind of go through it and, and tell a story about what Barbara Liskov had presented and also um, creative thinking. So a bit of a sidetrack about doodles. Um, some while back, in 1996, um, there was what was known as the Davos Doodle Scandal. Uh, does anybody recall that? Okay, so um, Davos, um, they have a meeting, all the great and good go there. It's a bit like the Bilderberg thing that's going on at the minute, but different organisation. Um, it was the World Economic Forum that were having one of these jollies. Um, and they were talking about stuff like um, the end of easy oil, um, global pandemics, global warming, um, Iraq, really important stuff. Uh, at the end of one of the days, um, the people doing the clearing up um, found a doodle which had been um, left behind by Tony Blair. And this is the doodle that they found. Oh dear, it hasn't come up very very clearly, I'm afraid, I enlarged it too much, but um, you can see there were boxes with stuff written in, written in them. Um, and I suppose for a bit of a lark, some journalists sent it off to some graphologists, uh, people who study handwriting and um, relate it, allegedly, to psychological states. Well, um, this graphologist said that They'd analysed this doodle and um, they deduced from it that uh, Tony Blair, who was Prime Minister of the UK at this time, um, was aggressive, unstable, struggling to concentrate, not a natural leader, struggling to keep control of a confusing world, and an unstable man who is feeling under enormous pressure. So, um, it didn't actually belong to Tony Blair. Um, it belonged to Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I'm sure Tony Blair's handwriting is better than that. <laughs> so um, there was some backtracking about the analysis of the doodle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it kind of um, reignited some debate about is graphology a science or a pseudoscience? Anyway. Like, it's the same as. Uh, I didn't even realise there was a debate about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, a doodle. <clears throat> what, what we're aiming at with a doodle that's going to help us with those things, memory, communication, storytelling, uh, solving problems, is something that is going to um, engage your brain, um, so it's going to actually doing the drawing, converting what you're hearing um, into an image um, gives you some sort of cognitive stimulation and that's going to keep you awake, focused. Um, and you're engaging in the exchange of information with the people that you're talking with or, or that are presenting to you and you're going to use that to um, reflect the information back. Now. Um, a professor at Plymouth University has done some research on this, Jackie and Drade, and um, so there is some little bit of science behind it. So, 
What keeps you engaged? Well, basically, we're animals. Um, a dog is supposed to have four thoughts for each paw. Food, food, sex, and food. <laughs> and we're not that far from um, those animals, like dogs in the animal kingdom. So there are, there are three things which often keep you engaged. Sex, threats, and emotions. So when you, when you see something or hear about something, your primitive responses, which are always there underneath our sophisticated exteriors, are, um, can I eat it? Will, it? Will it eat me? Can I have sex with it? Does anyone do that? <laughs> so, bearing that in mind, how can we make our doodling kind of strategic or helpful? <clears throat> well, um, the purpose of the strategic doodling is to kind of track your auditory input content, translate um, stuff into a visual language, so it might be text, what you're hearing, and to sketch a mental model um, of something that will help you to uh, understand what happened when, when you see that picture again. Um, so uh, a mechanical engineer called Leonard Archer, who um, does design research at the Royal College of Art in London, he said that, um, according to him, people working through problems seem to form images in their mind's eye, manipulating and evaluating ideas before, during and after externalising them. So, here's um, one of the first, might even be the first, Google Doodle. Um, so, this Doodle appeared um, in 1998, very early days of Google. The company wasn't even incorporated then. Anybody know what it's supposed to represent? It's the burning, man. Like burning Man. That's, That's right. It's the Burning Man. So, um, the, the founders um, decided they were going to go off and attend the uh, Burning Man Festival in the Nevada desert. And so they, they put this doodle onto their logo. Um, it was supposed to be a, a message to Google users that their founders were out of office, working hard. So um, this was quite a simple doodle, um, but the idea of decorating a company logo to celebrate um, events, maybe notable events, was born then. And from then on, we so we've got a few more. Um, this one celebrates Euler's birthday, so I quite like that one. Uh, this one here, this was the World Cup 2002. Sorry about the reproduction, they've not come out too well. Anyone got any idea what this one might be? Mm, Royal Wedding? <laughs> On the right lines. So it's obviously to do with um, well, I'll go back to sex, but it's love and romance. Um, it's the um, Brazilian equivalent of our Valentine's Day in 2012. They showed this in Brazil. Uh, and the last one of these, um, they have a, a Doodle for Google competition every year for youngsters. And this was um, a winner in the youngest age group. It was illustrating my best day ever. So you've got a kid doing ballet, I think, acrobatics. It's rather sweet. So, keeping people's attention. Are you bored? You think, well, I certainly thought, if you're feeling bored, then your brain has gone to sleep. It's not very active. But the psychologists say that the reverse is true. Um, if you look at people's brain function, according to Jackie Andra, the professor at Plymouth University, 
um, when they're bored, they're actually using a lot of energy. Brains are very active, they measure a lot of function. And it's because your brain is designed to um, be processing information constantly in case of threats. Is a bear about to attack you from behind? Sorry. So, because you're bored with what you're supposed to be doing, you'll be thinking about other things. So, um, if your environment has turned out to be lacking in stimulating information, you're, you're going to make some up. Your brain doesn't want to switch off, it wants to be busy in case you're about to be attacked, so it needs to be awake and alert. So, um, so the brain um, so kind of scavenges around for something to do. And um, we typically what happens is you start daydreaming. So you're in a really boring talk and uh, your mind wanders off. And you start thinking, well, where would I like to be instead? I might be on holiday, that kind of thing. But making those daydreams means that your brain it's actually using up a lot of energy, so it's quite busy. So the function of doodling, according to Andrade, um, is to provide just enough cognitive stimulation um, during something that otherwise might be quite boring for you to stop your mind going off and daydreaming about being on holiday um, and focus on the stuff to hand. Um, she did an experiment um, with college students where half the set was, um, they were made to listen to a really boring telephone conversation. Half the set was allowed to doodle during the listening, the other half was not allowed. And um, the half that was allowed to doodle retained 29% more information than the other half. An interesting figure very precise. <laughs> so, um, people who study these kinds of things um, like to classify learning into four different modes. Auditory, when you listen to stuff and you learn it. Reading and writing, when you read stuff and write it down, up to you. Um, kinesthetic, where you're actually doing physical things, help you to learn. <coughs> so, that an example might be if you workshop learning to sharpen a tool, uh, you will use some kinesthetic learning mode. And visual, which is what this talk is about, um, using your visual abilities to help you learn stuff. So seeing and drawing. Now the theory is that when you combine two modes of learning, um, it will increase your um, both your emotional involvement with the content and your memory retention of the content. So, for example, if you're listening and sketching at the same time, that's a good combination of, the, um, of, the two, of those two modes of learning. You've got your mind and your body working together. Um, when you're listening, you're, you're, you're analysing stuff, when you're drawing, you're synthesising stuff. Those are going to use both sides of your brain, and your left, left brain for the analytic stuff, and your right brain for the creative stuff, the more holistic stuff. So you've got lots of synapses firing across the brain, um, and it's um, going to help you uh, retain stuff and, and understand it. So. Um, been talking about memory and remembering stuff it's pretty important um, in our in our line of work um, so I just wanted to um, talk about a couple of memory techniques which are sort of um, which are closely associated with um, visualizing things visual thinking um, the first um, one of the two is um, sometimes called a memory palace. Um, in this way, um, in this way of remembering stuff, um, you, you need to, you've got a whole set of data that you need to try and remember. 
Let's say um, it's a pack of cards and you're in one of these um, memory competitions and you've got to memorise um, a pack of cards that's been shuffled. Um, you, the technique says choose a room or a house that you know quite well, so it's probably not going to be Buckingham Palace unless you've visited it quite a lot. Um, and you um, go into this room and you walk round the room, you've got the deck of cards in your hand and you place each card in turn in the sequence in the next place that you come to in the room and you sort of picture these objects in the room as you walk around it. So then when you have to um, repeat the sequence of data, you take yourself back to the room, you can see it and you can see the objects in it as you walk round it in sequence. Um, the second te technique I wanted to mention is um, rhyming numbers. So this is this will be used for um, remembering a sequence of digits, e.g. your pin, something like that. So um, this technique, you associate a rhyming word with each of the digits. So I've got some examples there. One done, two shoe, three tree, four door. You get the idea. Five, five, six sticks. Then you've got a sequence of digits. Um, you create a story with the digits and with, with um, each of those uh, digits for the rhyme you create a visual image. So for a bun you create an image of a bun. Um, so on. And then you can rebuild the story and the images together to recreate the um, sequence. Now, it's most effective if you try and make outrageous images, really extreme ones. So, to memorise my pin, I've got a door, a bun, tree and a mine. It's not really my pin. <laughs> oh, you're married not. to search space now. Yeah. <laughs> it may or may not be. <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, that's looking at a couple of ways that you can use images to help memory. Um, what I want to look at now is um, visual note taking or sketch notes as um, it's become known in some circles. So this is what I've tried to encourage people to do here and in fact um, I, I did some at QCon. Um, I started doing stuff, I don't know if you can see this, but I'd started doing stuff before um, Heather's talk. What I was trying to do was um, you know, keep myself a bit amused, but I was trying to draw the faces of the people who were giving the talk. I don't know if it helped me remember what they were talking about. But so obviously I was delighted when Heather came along and, and completely validated what I was doing. I was really allowed to do this. So I drew a picture of her, she was quite smartly dressed. Um, I've got a picture of a very angry fish here, I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did that mean? So. <laughs> Drawing um, images as you hear what's going on to represent the contents of what you're hearing is going to um, add to your emotional experience of the talk and will make it easy, easier to share with um, your peers when you go back and have to give them a presentation on a talk you went to at QCOM. And you can learn what the end of fish means. <laughs> Well, <laughs> hasn't helped me at all, not even looking at it. It's actually the angry fish is by a house whose roof says sex threats emotion. <coughs> and the, the main part of the house says spatial navigation. So perhaps it was representing threats. Um, 
and there's a, um, a chap who's uh, probably make, making a living out of doing sketch notes and he's made this handbook. So I, I really put this slide up because I thought he got some quite nice little icons on the cover of his cover of his book. So um, with the drawing, <clears throat> kids love to do drawings and um, when they show you the drawing they want to tell you about it. So that's helping them to start a conversation and that's part of what um, Heather wants us to do with our drawings to make it easier to start a conversation, um, sort of a two-way thing about um, what's going on. Um, she also suggests that if you do this in meetings, she showed a template that you could use in meetings, but the slides of that haven't been put up and I couldn't copy the template because it's quite complicated, so maybe when they do eventually put the slides up I'll be able to show that. But she had some template which would um, allow you in a meeting where you're trying to solve a problem um, to record everybody's ideas in, a, in some kind of graphical format. She said it worked best for big picture thinking. I, I don't know, I mean, I, I tend to find I, I can't think with a pencil in my hand anyway, you know, especially if we're talking about some kind of design problem. I do need to sketch it out. I can't, I can't just do it with talking. Um, and that's something to do with the, those modes of learning that I was talking about earlier. Um, some people are, have a m sort of bigger bias towards visual learning. Some people have a bigger bias towards kinesthetic learning. Um, so if, if you have got more of a bias to visual learning, you will find it really helpful to draw stuff from people are talking at you. Um, and also, as I, as I said before, it's going to help you tell a story. If you've got a sequence of images, kind of will bring back what was going on. Um, these um, notes or drawings, um, don't have to be good. I, I can't draw, I'm not an artist, you know, it's really embarrassing when you're, you're grown up and you try and draw and, you know, it still looks like a kid's drawing, but it doesn't matter. It can be rough, and, it, and if it's rough and not good, it's easier to draw for other people to draw on top of it and put their ideas on it as well, because, you know, it's, they're not really spoiling anything. Um, and um, hopefully, we I might be able to get the template for meetings sometime, people interested in that, when the slides are eventually posted. So, some ideas um, for drawings. Our brains are hardwired to recognise stuff visually. They're, they're in particular, one of the things they're hardwired to recognise is faces. Um, so, putting faces in your drawings um, can... Uh, will incorporate emotion, you know, the feelings that you're feeling when, when you're in a meeting or a presentation. You can draw pictures. Now, when my kids were at school, um, at one stage they, they would come home with a sheet which showed them for one particular lesson what they'd been doing. Um, there was a choice of three rabbits that they could draw. Um, one with the ears up, rabbits with the ears up, um, one with the ears down and one sort of half up and half down. And it showed how they'd enjoyed the lesson. Well, I thought this was such a great idea that I actually use it when I go to conferences. So all my conference notes have got a picture of a rabbit at the top. Um, I'm happy to say that Heather Willen's ones has got two ears sticking up. Um, but some of them, regretfully, have got two ears sticking down. But um, it's, it's quite a fun way of, of, of recording your, your view of... Um, going on. Anyway, that's, that's the first phase. Um, what does this look like? What sort of emotional... Angry fish. Yeah. It's an uh, angry pasture and tomato sauce, I think. <laughs> a surprised one. I don't know, what... Comical robot. Yeah. It was robot billed as a... A clown, yes. <laughs> oh, very sad. <laughs> Probably did love that one. Right, so I'm spot on time. Um, Heather got to exactly this time, which said 
what's the time? Has anyone got the time? How much time have I got left? Nobody answered. It's really quite embarrassing. So I said, okay, anyway, she looked at her watch. I'm on time. Um, it's your turn. So has everybody got a pencil and some paper? Good. Um, these five basic shapes, you can use these to make a drawing of almost anything. A circle, square, rectangle, a triangle, um, line and a dot. So um, the first exercise is one which will help you to incorporate emotion into your drawings. It's not the rabbits, um, but it's going to use basic sh these basic shapes. So um, step one, um, on a piece of paper, can you draw nine circles in a three by three um, matrix? And step two, in the middle of each circle, can you do two dots? We're going to make faces. And step three, you can do a little L for a nose under the eyes. In all of them? In all of them, yes. They all need, um, everybody on your piece of paper needs eyes and the nose. Okay, all done. Now, um, step four. We're going to use um, these lines on the right hand side. Um, step four, in the first column, in all rows, can you add a straight line below the nose? This doesn't illustrate that. I want you to do a straight line under the nose. Down the first column. And in the second column, add the upward curve below the nose. And in the third column, add the downward curve below the nose. So, step five, in the first row, across the first row, add a straight line above the eyes. And in the second... not a straight line. No, it isn't a straight line, no. <laughs> Good spot. <laughs> do you want a straight line or do you want one of those? I want you in the first row to add a straight line above the eyes. I'm glad you're paying attention. And in the second row, you can add an upward curving line above the eyes. And across the third row or columns, add the downward curve above the eyes. So you now should have um, nine faces, um, and they should each look different. Um, and they are there to represent nine different emotions. So um, can you label each face with the emotion that you think it represents? There are nine emotions. He says emotions. Well, I didn't say, uh, did I say they had to be, they were different? I said the faces were different. You've got nine different representations. Um, and if you're someone with only two emotions, I guess you're yeah. going to have to spread them around <laughs> quite, uh, quite well.
if when you're done, you'd like to hold your drawing up so that I can see it. I, I'd really like that. Don't mind. Here. I seem to have cheated. I didn't label mine in the talk. It's too bad. She <laughs> disagreed me. What did what did people get for this one? We got five. Quizzical. Quizzical. Yeah. Quizzical. Angry, That's confused. Yeah. yeah, I got angry for that one. Yeah. Well, angry. Thoughtful. It's probably just something about. <laughs> <laughs> They're quite scary, aren't they? When you look at all nine of them together. So um, that exercise, um, the design that to give you um, a start of what she called a visual library. So the second exercise that she gave um, was to put some more things into this visual library. Um, do people need some more paper? You've got plenty. If anyone needs more, Chris has got, Chris has got it. Um, she, um, she asked us to um, draw icons um, for these things. Um, so the first was framework. I found this really hard. I find it hard because I can't draw in 3D. In 3D? I'm drawing 2D, wait, I don't know. Okay, so if you just like to work through them all and I'll have a little rest. <laughs> yes, are we done? If you're done, hold it up. No? Need more time? made me confirm that I think a lot better in words and pictures. <laughs> 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 well, I wasn't sure what I was yeah. doing, because I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know what the light bulb was the idea. <laughs> 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 I Have I doubled this up? It's great. See, some of them look quite like mine. Yes, yes. Or yeah. digital ones. Yeah. And your ideas. Yeah, They're I quite think common, it's kind of common, yeah. Yeah, and vision. Yes, we've all got eyes. It's common, common icons. Story, yes. yeah. Your book's better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my first. I don't know what that's. I think that's supposed to be a mouth. Is, but then I realised that was going to be conversation. It's like someone kissing a frying pan. I don't know what they do. <laughs> really struggled on. I tried to do that. I couldn't do it. I've done that for a few years. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. drew a pin on the side. Mm, yeah. So sort of what you look at rather than what you do. Yeah. Brainstorming. I, I drew yeah. the two halves like of the brain. You know, they look a bit like walnut halves and kind of. Mm lines coming out of them. Yeah. Like a brain and a story. Well, they're, they're, yeah. mm. Brainstorming. Oh, yeah. I did a point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the brain might be much like that. Could I come back to my own time and work out what they mean? Yeah. Because I wanted to copy it too much like the real But does it have to last such a long time? Or is it just to remind you while you come to read it? Yeah. Type everything up later or? Okay. So the, the last exercise um, was um, to um, take another sheet of paper, a clean bit, and um, to draw four circles in a configuration like this um, with, um, with arrows going in a clockwise direction around the big circle. Make them bigger than mine. I was struggling a bit with the <laughs> 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 um, And <clears throat> when you've got your four circles, in the left-hand circle, 
um, draw your icon for vision. And in the top circle, um, draw your icon for thinking. <laughs> That's the worst one. Yes. Oh, you've got the opportunity to um, improve it. And in the right hand circle, uh, draw your icon for conversation. And in the bottom circle, um, draw your icon for story. So, um, another of the keynotes at QCon London this year um, was given um, um, by um, a, a, a pearl um, expert, but um, the talk was about how to give a brilliant presentation. And one of the things you said when organising your talk is to make sure that it tells a story so with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, some narrative to it. Um, so that's partly what this exercise here is about. Um, so if in the left hand circle where you did your icon for vision, you write by that circle creative thinking. And um, for the top circle, um, write memory. Uh, the right circle, um, right communication. And the bottom circle, right story time. And now in the middle of the big circle, right ideas, not art. And now, you've created a visual summary of the talk, of Heather Willen's talk, which hopefully I've tried to reproduce some of for you here today. So you can use this technique for any talk or meeting that you go to, to create a visual summary, um, which you can then use to remember it, to replay the story, um, and to communicate it to other people. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Anybody got any questions? <clears throat> Have you used this technique since? Well, I haven't been to a conference since, but I still do doodle in meetings, if I remember to take the How about, the How about uh, brown bags? Have you, uh... Brown bags. I haven't, I haven't done it for brown bags, no. I've, I've got a pile of them from QCon, but uh, I haven't mm. done it for brown bags. Does anyone here think they might do it, do it for brown bags? Might do, you know. It's always bearing relationship to what's going on in the talk. No, I don't think they do, no, do they? No, I never do. But, but maybe if you tried to make them bear yeah. some relation to the talk, it, it, would be, it would help you understand the talk better. Do you think it's more suited for us in where you're trying to receive and process information rather than where you're being involved in the meeting? I don't know. What, what do other people think? I could, I could think of being involved in a meeting that you might use it to try and 
because you've got the problem and you've got several competing things and that affects that and so I can see the sort of scribbling and drawing arrows mm -hmm. just to... I'm just looking at the whiteboard here, I mean, you know, we, we use them a lot, don't we? They, they're not showing emotions as such, but you couldn't, you couldn't do some of this planning or, or design without them. I just take notes and everything, don't we? So it's the same kind of thing, but drawing rather words. Yeah. Well, one thing about the brown bags, it's terribly hot in here, isn't it? Yeah. I was so sleepy last week. It was really interesting, but I just found it really hard to keep concentrating. So I must remember to bring pencil next time. Yes, I found the engagement. I got to the point where I was feeling sleepy just yes. as you got to start drawing things and I haven't felt sleepy to say. Gosh, excellent. <laughs> well, I know when I was um, when I was at Warwick University, um, eventually I got a, book, a little booklet It was something about, you know, how to keep your students engaged and it said what you must do in any lecture, you know, 20 minutes, that's about tops for what people are going to take in get them to do something. And it just completely changed um, my attitude to giving a lecture and how to structure it and how to make it, um, well, it made it more interesting for me, I think, to get people to do stuff. And sometimes you can get someone to come up and write on the board and get, like today, I mean, I, I just did exactly what Heather did in her talk, but, you know, make everybody do something individually. Divide people up. I, I think it was a great idea, and that that also came over in the um, in in the talk I mentioned about how to give a decent talk. You know, don't expect people to be able to concentrate really for much more than 20 25 minutes. I mean, we all have to sit there for an hour, but it, it's too long, isn't it? Especially when it's. Hot. Do you think they're better when you're actually? originally actually receiving the information and doodling, then actually coming back to them later on. So I tend to find mine a little bit obscure. I mean, I don't do all yes. that anyway. They're obtuse. You know, I probably got more brain full of them while I was doing them and kind of having some fun. And later on coming back and trying to use them in some way. But, I, I think I, I agree with that, yes. It's, it's a lot of fun to do them at a the time. But the angler fish was, I mean, that was <laughs> propped up a bit. I'm sure it was your fish. <laughs> No, you teeth. should see its teeth. It's got massive green teeth. Teeth are memorable. And the eyes that are really staring at me. Looking at it slightly differently, I, I, I was, as I've said, I'm a very non-visual person. But I um, found it interesting that the classic four modes of learning didn't involve thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and I tend to find that when I'm concentrating, when I'm very engaged in a, a talk or something like that, I'm actually chewing over what's being said in my head verbally. And I found that I have no recollection of anything that happened since we started drawing. Uh, mm. Drawing drives everything else out of my mind. I can't do anything whilst I'm drawing. <laughs> so it doesn't really mm. work for me. But I, I am, I've noticed this before. I'm, you know, of the spectrum of people who are sort of verbal to visual. I'm way over the verbal end. Mm. Uh, to an extent where I don't see diagrams, headings, things like that. I miss them. People say, do you not see the diagram? What diagram? <coughs> <laughs> I'm the same. I find it very hard. I mean, a fair amount of studying, I always find it easy to read the textbook in a logical order rather than yeah. trying to sort of kind of get a visual representation of it. Yeah. It just seems much easier when you know the information is consistent. And, you know, well, well, I tell form. you, a kind of verbal doodles, so diagramming words together works for me. I can mm. do that and still mm. pay attention. Like mental you, maps sort of thing. Yeah, you know, it's little diagrams, generally, you know, words with sticks between them. Work, that works quite, I mean, a type of doodle, but they're, they're not, uh, they're just... They're language oriented. Yeah, language but it's the same language process language. of relating ideas. Mm. I struggle with the, the going for a rude example, because if I go to the, I think about the rooms I'm most familiar with, I can't remember anything in them. <laughs> because I don't take that information, like Richard, I just don't take that information in. So I'll like, look at a picture on the walls and go, well, is that new? And she now put it there two years ago. Oh, all right. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> just a man, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't 
find the room one any good either, but I like the one where you make a story around some images. So I think I showed, mm -hmm. I showed some images like a, a door, um, a burn, a tree and a mine. And the story I made up to go with that was, well, I opened a door and um, right behind the door was this amazing bun. It's just a ridiculous bun with a blue eye thing coming out of the middle. And um, I, I um, ate, ate the bun and it, it enabled me to climb up to the top of this tree because I've got all this bun inside me. <laughs> Went up the tree and then, uh, and then I fell down the tree, whoosh, um, and landed up in a mine. And, you know, that's quite a funny story because you've got the pictures to sort of make the story more real. Then, then you can bring the digits back, which are quite boring, really. <laughs> yeah. You sure that's not your thing, though? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Do you have difficulty recalling your pin? It's usually yeah. when you're in a stressful situation, you've got to pay for something. I don't know, your train's about to go, and you've got to pay, and that's it, it just goes completely blank. No idea what it is. I just remember the, the pattern on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Don't actually know memory, yeah. A lot of trouble if the pattern is a bit. bit come to a keyboard where it's arranged differently. Yeah, well the constant, mm -hmm. they put them upside down. Oh, or a phone versus oh. a calculator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be reassured that just doing a little bit of doodling is not concentration wandering. So well that was the best thing for me. Mm -hmm. When Nick like said she thing, gave, gave you permission yeah, to doodle. But you had it drummed in from a young age and then getting in school and getting in trouble for it so, so mm -hmm. often. But yeah. doodling because I wasn't concentrating. Never really felt that I wasn't. I always thought the whole what you're supposed to do in class is the exact opposite of learning. Because it's sit still, shut up, don't doodle, don't talk to anyone. So you've no you've no engagement of any kind with the material. It's, it's, it's a guaranteed way of not learning. Oh, that's killing all the this way you yeah. know, approaching yeah. learning experience is just killing learning experience. Yeah. Because it's not going to be learning. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just you know ticking boxes. Course, yeah. I, I always feel bad when I see lots of other engineers who've got these very neat notebooks, some of them hardback books, and they've got their whole day very neatly organised, and all the ideas written in them, and I look back at my pad and it's just this mess of stuff that I've doodled and written. So, can I get rid of a bit of the guilt for that mm -hmm. as well? <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't do guilt. We're all different anyway. Well, it's like any technique, isn't it? It's not going to work for everybody, no. you know, and uh, if you're not a visual person, then it's not necessarily going to be the most beneficial, but... Uh, I think Rich played the thing, so isn't yeah. give it a go, see what happens. I mean, like you were saying, Richard, is, uh, you, you're still you know, drawing words together and phrases and that, so you can bring you know, the... I mean, I do that when I take notes as well, doing arrows between everything and linking bits together, so even if I'm not drawing a little picture of what it is, I've got the words there, but showing how it's linked in visually rather than yeah. writing it out longhand. Great, well, thanks for coming, everybody, and doing the drawings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.